Well, b- welcome back to another episode of Phil Paper Roulette. Hopefully I got the uh, music working this time. At least I like it if you can't hear it. Um, we're just picking random papers out of uh, Phil. Off, uh, I can download off the interwebs and uh, reviewing them. So here we go. I'm doing analysis papers just because basically just getting warmed up and they're more manageable in length. So what do we got? <clears throat> I just did one on Aristotle on the principle of non-contradiction before this. Ooh, Paradoxes of Time Travel by Ron Wasserman. That's a review. On being cruel to a chair. Can one be cruel to an inanimate object? You argue that you can define cruelty as taking pleasure and intentionally causing suffering to another person. Animal or inanimate objects, whether su- such suffering be genuine, mistakenly believed, or sincerely hoped for. So, if you're sadistic, you're sadistic. Okay. The intentional principle and doctrine of double effect. Exemplarist moral theory. Sideways music. Interesting. Single manifold that is appropriately called space-time. One consequence of this this thesis is that changing an object's orientation in the manifold does not change its intrinsic features. In this paper, I offer a new argument against this popular theory. I claim that especially good performance of a particularly beautiful piece of music when oriented. Oh, okay. So, here we got an art, uh, performative, um, challenge to, uh, uh, the four-dimensionalism. That's interesting. Uh, you know, let's take a look at that real quick. Yeah. So, okay. So, might as well go for this one. Let's see, we've got Clicky Clicky, Ned, Marcosian, Sideways Music. Then, so let's see, what do we got here? Um, let's just do some bookkeeping real quick because why not? Sideways music, Ned Marcosian. There is a popular theory in the metaphysics of time, according to which time is one of four similar dimensions that make up a single manifold, which is appropriately called space-time. Some of the ways in which time is supposed to be similar to the dimensions of space, according to this theory, include the following. One, there is no intrinsic direction of time. Two, physical objects are extended in time in virtue of having different temporal parts in different regions of time. Three, the so-called A properties, such as being present, being past, and being future, are not to be included in accurate descriptions of fundamental reality. Four, there is no such thing as the passage of time. Five, there are no ontological distinctions between past, present, and future. I will refer to this popular theory as the space-time thesis. Here is a formulation of the view. The space-time thesis. The universe is spread out in four symmetrical and similarly similar dimension, four symmetrical and similar dimensions, each one orthogonal to each other one, which together make up an isotropic four-dimensional manifold appropriately called space-time. Humans tend to perceive one dimension, the one we will call time, as different from the others in various ways, but in reality, no one of the dimensions is intrinsically different from any of the others. It is worth emphasizing that the different components I am building into the space-time thesis need not all be combined in this way. There are a number of mix-and-match variations that have been endorsed in print. One notable version of the space-time thesis will allow that time may be slightly different from the dimensions of space in certain respects. Yeah, 
For some philosophers with space-time sympathies may want to take the symmetry in what is allowed along time-like dimensions to be by special relativity or some other physical theory to be an intrinsic feature of time itself rather than merely a contingent fact about the spread of physical phenomena in the actual universe, and such people will accordingly want to say that if time is different in at least one respect from the other dimensions of the manifold. I will return to this point below. Yeah. It's like, yeah, maybe time is slightly different from the other ones, but these space-time theses are generally uh, three space and one time, but you just gotta, you take it as a package. The main rival to the space-time thesis is sometimes called the dynamic theory of time. According to the dynamic theory, time is very different from the dimensions of space, is also sometimes said by philosophers in this camp that is more like modality than like the dimensions of space. Here is the formulation of this view, the dynamic theory of time. Time is completely different from dimensions of space in several important ways. Time has an intrinsic direction. Physical objects do not have temporal parts. A properties, gener a properties are genuine and unanalyzable features of reality. The passage of time, that is, the process by which and events continually change with respect to their A properties, is an objective and mind-independent phenomenon. There are important five. There are important ontological distinctions between the present, on the one hand, and the past and future, on the other hand. Yeah. So okay. I want to offer a new argument for the dynamic theory and against the space-time thesis. Okay. My argument has important presupposition, namely realism about aesthetic value. I assume that there is such a thing as aesthetic value, both positive and negative, that is an intrinsic feature of whatever possesses it and that it contributes to the overall intrinsic value of the world. Okay, so aesthetic value is somehow very fundamental. I have in mind such examples as the beauty of a specific oak tree and the ugliness of a pile of trash. I take it that the facts about aesthetic value are objective and mind-independent facts. Thus, on the version of aesthetic realism that I am presupposing, the value of a beautiful object is an intrinsic property of the object itself and does not depend on the objects being appreciated by some sentient being, nor does it depend on the object's disposition to produce a particular kind of aesthetic experience in a sentient being. Finally, I also assume that we are at least sometimes correct and justified in our judgments about aesthetic values. So, okay, it's a very um, realist version of aesthetic value. There's something real out there, and we might get it right or wrong at different times, but it's just a property of things in the world. It's real. Okay, for whatever your understanding of real is. Um, clear enough so far, but now how does that matter to time? With these assumptions in mind, consider an object that has some positive aesthetic value, a lovely oak tree, say, or Van Gogh's painting, The Starry Night. Here is a notable fact about aesthetic value. If we rotate the painting 90 degrees, so that it is hanging sideways on the wall, is its aesthetic value will be unaffected. It might be hardest for us to appreciate the value of the painting after it has been rotated in this way, but this problem could be easily overcome by changing our own orientation in space. I don't know. If you're hanging up upside down, do you appreciate art the same way? Maybe not. Similarly, when the orientation of the tree in space changes as a result of the rotation of our entire planet, does not change the aesthetic value of the tree. Well, again, yeah, see, the aesthetic value is not... Uh, Observer dependent, so it has nothing to do that we actually are rotating with it. These facts follow from the more general fact that when an object is located in an n dimensional space consisting of perfectly similar dimensions like our three dimensional physical space, changing the orientation of the object in that space does not change the object's intrinsic features. Now, Consider an especially good performance of a particularly beautiful piece of music for specificity and to keep things relative simple, let it be a short seven-note passage from a piano solo by Nina Simone. Yeah, Nina. And for reasons that will become clear shortly, let it be a passage that happens to include the, the playing of seven different notes corresponding to seven different keys on the piano's keyboard, so that no one note is repeated. In keeping with our assumption of realism about aesthetic value, I am assuming that this series of events 
the occurring of these seven notes in the concert hall contributes some positive intrinsic value to the world. Recall that we are considering an especially good performance of a particular piece of music. Uh, beautiful. Uh, but, uh, note that if we now rotate the series events around the up-down spatial dimension by rotating the piano 90 degrees on the stage floor, this change in the spatial orientation of the series events will not affect its contribution to the intrinsic value of the world. Likely, likewise, if Miss Simone simply waits around for six hours and then repeats her performance after Earth has rotated 90 degrees on its axis, the second performance of the seven-note passage will be no less beautiful than the first one despite being oriented differently in space. I mean, frankly, if she's playing it once, the Earth is spinning rather fast, and none of the notes are played at the same orientation ever. All of this is in keeping with the point made above about rotating an object, in this case a series of events, and a manifold of similar dimensions does not affect its intrinsic features, including its aesthetic value. So far, so good. But now imagine rotating the seven-note passage of music in the four-dimensional manifold that is space-time in such a way that the result is a series of events that consist of the same seven notes all occurring at the same time. This is what I'm calling sideways music. Uh, I don't understand why that's sideways, but it would be compressed all into one instant. It is the result of rearranging a series of events in the manifold, the hammer striking events inside the piano, so that instead of being spread out slightly in time and also along one of the spatial dimensions, that the series of events is still spread out slightly along the relevant spatial dimensions, but is no longer spread out in time. Okay, so you've removed the time element, basically. I mean, okay, you removed the time element. Perhaps some illustrations will make this example clearer. Let's see the illustrations. Figure 1A represents a painting's normal orientation space, and 1B represents the re resulting rotation of the painting that is hanging sideways on the wall. Alright, we've got rectangles. Normal art and sideways art. I mean, they you could have put a stick figure there, and then you could at least have seen that there was something different, except the silly hex pattern. But that's fine. Meanwhile, figure 2A... Well, Below represents the original performance of the seven note passage by Nina Simone with the series of events made up of the resulting sound spread out slightly in time and also in one of the spatial dimensions, whereas figure 2B represents the same series of events but rotated in the manifold such a way that the sounds all occur at the same time. Where's the, uh, no demonstration of this? Where's figure 2? Okay. So, normal music, sideways music, that's down here. So you can see that as time increases and uh, striking notes increase, but now we've sort of rotated the uh, from the angle here and gone to flat. So, yeah. Meanwhile, figure two below represent the same series of events. I trust that the reason for the odd feature of the example requiring it to consist a series of seven notes with no one note repeated is now evident. This was to make it clear e easier for Miss Simone to play all the notes at once in the sideways version of the example. But it is also important that this is an inessential feature of the example. Mrs. Simone could have been playing a non-standard piano with seven keys corresponding to a single note, or we could have produced the same series of sounds by playing a recording of our passage through speakers on the stage concert hall with one speaker for each of the seven notes lined up in such a way that spatial relations among the speakers are isomorphic to the temporal relations among the notes in the past. Yes, you can do this more than one way. In fact, for the topologically minded among us, this last version of the example will offer the clearest illustration of how sideways music can be the result of literally rotating some object, in this case a series of events, in the manifold in a way that is perfectly analogous to the rotation of the painting that produced sideways art. In order to see this, imagine a short piece of string extended diagonally in it a three-dimensional space in such a way that it is at 45 degree angle with respect to each of the uh, three axes. Then imagine pulling down the string flat so there's a 90 degree angle with respect to the up-down axis while remaining at a 45 degree axis with respect to the other two axes. Finally, replace the string with a series of sound events on our con concert stage and let the top-down axis re represent time. This is why what I am calling sideways music. Yeah, so it's like pulling... Yeah, yeah, so you've 
collapsed one of the dimensions. Returning to my argument is a consequence of the space-time thesis that the series of events that result from rotating our short musical performance and the four-dimensional manifold, the sideways music, shouldn't have the same aesthetic value as the original series of events, but it doesn't. Whereas the original series of events had some consider considerable positive aesthetic value for it was a passage from this especially good performance from your piece of music, the resulting series of events has either no aesthetic value or more likely negative aesthetic value since it's a cacophony of sound consisting of seven notes all occurring at once. Ha hence we have a powerful modus tones against the space-time thesis. I have some questions here because look, the argument is supposed to be something about the realism of music, but I mean the cacophony uh, here that you're getting is only a cacophony of us. Who's to say that someone who themselves was collapsed into the, or the same, a sideways person that was collapsed in the same, rotated in the same way that the music was, would perceive it differently. So it seems like we're perceiving the music here as <clears throat> um, we normally do, but we're not, but we're, we're trying to judge the music as we normally do. But the argument is that they had intrinsic beauty one way and then not the other. So, why should the intrinsic beauty make a difference to the change in intrinsic beauty make a difference to us in how we perceive it if it was already an intrinsic uh, part of the music beforehand? I'm not entirely certain that. We are. This is being judged on this uh, on par. It seems like there is a the person listening to it matters in this example, but the person not listening to it didn't matter in the example before. I note as an aside that there are moral analogs of sideways music for consider a series of mental events that constitute some kind of positive moral devel development on the part of a subject. This series of events adds to the intrinsic value of the world. So we've got some thinking beneficially of someone in some morally good way. Now turn it sideways. What you have to have is a collection of simultaneous mental events spread out in space. It's hard to see how such a collection could add to the intrinsic value of the world in the same way. Oh, I'm not sure how you have mental events that constitute a moral uh, good, but granted that, say, mental events do have some reality to them, and then collapsing them into one uh, without any time, then perhaps the series then ceases to be a series, basically, and therefore the mental events can no longer be considered the mental progression that it was and therefore maybe not the same thought. So then thoughts would fail on this view. And that'd be an interesting argument again, uh, in philosophy of mind uh, against uh, the four-dimensionalist view uh, of space-time thesis that's being uh, argued against here. We take some series of events that constitute a wonderful narrative arc, but turning it sideways so that all the events are happening at once, again, the result does not seem as wonderful. Or think of a series of events that build from an unjust situation to a just re resolution. Well, how's that not a narrative? And now turn sideways or worse backwards. The result seems to be a situation which, with considerably less overall intrinsic value. I think that these cases can also be the basis for an interesting argument against the space-time thesis. But I will not pursue the argument here. Yeah, so this can be generalized. But again, I'm a little worried about the objectivity of these claims here. Why should these claims on how we feel about things when they've been rotated actually affect the in, their intrinsic value. That was part of the premise that we're, it, it has intrinsic value and we recognize it, but if it has the intrinsic value, we don't have to recognize it either. And so why should us not recognizing it in these cases actually uh, make a difference? One way the proponent of the space thesis could resist the argument from sideways music is denying the assumption that there is such a thing as intrinsic aesthetic value. Well, okay, yeah, deny the premise in that case. To me, this response is wildly implausible. It seems obvious to me that the world contains both tremendous beauty and terrible ugliness. Um, sure. 
But I understand that some people feel differently about this issue, and I do not wish to dogmatize about aesthetic realism here. Still, I want to emphasize that if I have shown the proponents of the space-time thesis must or even should deny aesthetic realism, then that is a big deal. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I kind of wonder that uh, the people, the, the overlap of people who work on aesthetics and uh, space-time thesis, what the overlap is right there. Um, maybe, like I said, if they, some of these other examples up here would have a better chance of finding someone with overlap and then willing to, um, make the argument that the, that instance, in philosophy, you can't argue from like one area against another area if there's no one else that thinks in terms of those two things it's just a uh you know if there's no one to review your paper then they can't get published if there's no one else to talk to because no one else studies those two things then no one will understand your argument because no there's no overlap in the uh population of philosophers that can do it so in some sense maybe the this is an interesting argument but the mm, to get it really the full force of it, you'd need to translate it into a different area. Um, good. Like I said, I don't I'm not. I'm not quite sure this buys it because of uh, the relation of mind independence here is uh, a little worrisome to me. But it would be in sideways music. Maybe you'd have much more. Uh, it would be much more. Uh, impressive to the space times folks if it was made maybe in terms of theory of mind <clears throat> okay metaphysic must deny aesthetic realism then that is a big deal metaphysicians working on the nature of time have not previously thought of aesthetic anti-realism as a consequence of one of the main views in the debate over the nature of time um yeah uh, i guess not but again this is what I'm talking about, the overlap in population. Another option for the space-time theory is to accept that normal music has intrinsic aesthetic value and to maintain that sideways music does too. That's what I was saying earlier, you just don't know it. The proponent of space-time thesis who takes this book will explain our re well, explain our reaction to sideways music was to perceive music as a very short-lived cacophony rather than as beautiful music by claiming that as a result of how human consciousness works we're not very good at perceiving the aesthetic value of sideways music that's not what i said this i understand what this is here but it's like we would also have to be twisted sideways in the same way to understand it and so it's like we're not arguing on equal footing here um it might be the same human consciousness, but we're not twisted the same way in time. We've not been turned sideways. And so it's like we're not on equal, yeah, not the same ground for uh, evaluating music. I, for one, do not find this response at all plausible, but this may well be simply an area where, where intuitions differ. Yeah, what this, what the author says here is, um, yeah, it's uh, just, it would say, well, again, it's just like how our consciousness works. It's saying there's some arbitrary part of our uh the way we think that um or way we perceive that prevents us from appreciating some aesthetically real uh beauty so i mean sure there might be beauties that we do not appreciate but i understand that the author here says well those aren't very plausible at least they don't really matter to us because if we can't perceive any of them then it's like saying well they're just ghosts and well if you want to go talk about looking at ghosts that's fine but it's not going to be taken seriously in any case i want to register that if this is the best response to my argument that is available to the space-time theorist then we have again uncovered a surprising and substantive substantive commitment concerning both the nature of aesthetic value and the limits of human perception of those who endorse the space-time thesis sure a third option for the proponent of the space time thing is to respond to the argument of sideways music by modifying the view in an attempt to avoid the relevant consequences, namely that it makes no aesthetic difference whether a musical performance is spread out in the manifold in the normal or a normal way or sideways. A space time theorist who takes this line will admit that ooh, that was a little loud. A space time a space time theorist sorry, the music is loud, I don't know if you can hear it. A space time theorist who takes this line will admit that time is at least a little bit different from the dimensions of space as what has an intrinsic direction say and that the slight difference in music in question let me drop that for just a 
I don't know if you can hear this, but it's loud for me. So, <clears throat> I'm a little different. The slight difference in music question and account for the difference in aesthetic value between Norman music and sideways music. I see two main problems with this response, and they are connected. Well, this is giving up uh, space time theory, going more towards a dynamic. The first problem is that there's a danger of a slippery slope. If we say the time is a little bit different from space, then why not say they're substantially different? Sure. Uh, I'm playing with music sliders, I'm sorry. For what is most appealing about the space-time thesis is that the elegant idea that it, time is exactly like the dimension of space, and that's what most, and that, and what is most intuitive about the dynamic theory is the idea that time is strikingly different from the dimensions of space, yes. Hence, there is pressure to move towards one or the two extreme positions on the question of time similarity to space rather to, than to occupy a middle position. Yeah, that would be a compatibilist sort of thing. And uh, you could do that, but it would be uh, yeah uncomfortable for, for the reasons reason. the author says and probably just for a whole host of other ones. The second problem with the current approach is that when you consider the ways in which orientation in the manifold seems to be relevant to the aesthetic value of a musical performance, it is the most dynamic aspects of the, the dynamic. <laughs> the dynamic aspects of the dynamic theory that seem crucial. I have in mind the idea that pastness, presentness, and future <laughs> futurity. I've not heard that one. I like that. Futurity. That's cool. Our genuine properties. The claim. Actually, I hadn't heard pastness and presentness either, but that's a. Uh, they're less exciting. The claim that only present objects and events are real. The idea that there's some kind of dynamic flow or passage of passage that characterizes time but none of the other dimensions and the claim that there is some inexorable something inexorable about this flow or passage it certainly does not help merely to say that there happens to be an asymmetry to certain time like dimensions within the manifold for example that is a result of some contingent facts about how causation works in the actual world for this reason the point raised above about how some people with space-time theses sympathize space-time thesis sympathies will want to say that time is at least a little bit different from the dimension of space owing to the relativistic condition considerations will be of little help to space-time theorists in dealing with the argument from sideways music. From what whatever small differences are causes between time-like dimensions and the manifold mere space-like dimensions will presumably not be enough to account for the great difference in aesthetic value between normal music and sideways music. Again... Why are you assuming that there is a great difference here? Is only argued from our perspective, but again, a perspectival version of music would uh, be an interesting theory, and then that would, uh, yeah, shore up the argument here. One thing that the argument from sideways music brings out is the crucial importance of certain tensed facts, i.e., facts involving a properties that such as the fact that only this note is present. Perhaps it is equally important that note that that note is in the recent past and also that, that the next note is in the near future. Another thing that it, the argument brings out is the importance of the fact that there is an essential dynamic aspect to time, for it is literally the passage through the sequence of the sounds, the jerk and whoosh, as Williams memorably puts it. Uh, sure, jerk and whoosh. <laughs> jerk and whoosh. That gives music the compelling quality it has. The dy dynamic aspect of music is essential to its aesthetic value and is directly tied to the dynamic aspect of time. UMass Amherst. Okay. Um, really not bad. Uh, Ned Marcosian of UMass Amherst, Department of Philosophy. Uh, let's see, do I know any of these people? I know Catherine Ritchie. Uh, met Ted Sider once. Uh, whatever. Yeah, so the argument here is, uh... If you treat time and space as identical then you can smush them in different ways and it shouldn't make any difference but if you smush music it ruins the music the problem here is if you give uh, realism to aesthetic 
uh, property, the, the music has real aesthetic properties, and smushing it shouldn't change the aesthetic properties, but smushing music is very different from a smushing or just rotating other things. Now you see what I did there, I smushed the music. If you smush a painting, like you collapse it into a little ball, it sort of ruins the painting too. And that's kind of what I feel is going on with the music here. But if you were also to have smushed your perspective along with the painting, so just because the painting is smushed, your sight is getting equally smushed. So from the outside, it looks smushed, but from the inside, it's all the same. It's like falling into a black hole. You don't actually feel like you're in a black hole. You just feel like you're falling normally. It doesn't, no one knows what happens when you get in there, but in your little uh, relativistic space-time bubble, you're okay. And see, that's what I fear is going on here, that anyone in the, the sideways world would uh, uh, appreciate the music the same way. Now, you're seeing what I'm saying there. There's a agent to appreciate the music. The, this argument depends on the objectivity of aesthetic values. So I, I feel like there's a uh, tension there, but this is very interesting in the sense that as the author said, this could be translated into other areas, and maybe it would have um, some pretty strong force against uh, the the sort of four-dimensional time time space view, space time view. Um, yeah, so that's it for now. I hope you like this. Um, if you want to leave a comment, uh, suggestion, or whatever, please do, and I will see you next time.